Good to see you all here this morning. I want to give a quick shout out to the greatest youth intern ever, Wyatt Fairman over there. That was his name uh, throughout this summer. Wyatt was an absolute joy uh, to work with, and I know he's blessed our lives. He's blessed you. He's blessed our youth group, and, uh, and hopefully you can stay today for the meal uh, so that we can honor him. Uh, this morning, we're continuing our series called Fortify the Home. Uh, remember that we've been talking about God's design of the home, so, uh, specifically looking at roles of men and women and children, men as the leader, protector, providers of the home. Uh, and we've been looking at uh, the roles for women, uh, that, that of indispensable help and indispensable companion uh, for man. And we looked at the role of children a couple of weeks ago, those who are to be obedient and submissive to their parents, because that's right, and that is the way things work best. I hope that you uh, want a fortified home and are working toward that today. But, however, you know, we've been talking about all these things. We've been talking about the perfect model uh, of, of what we need to embrace, what we need to embody to be vessels of God's glory. However, things don't always go according to plan. Uh, several years ago, uh, when I was a teenager, our family took a trip to Key West uh, all the way in the car from uh, Smyrna, Tennessee, all the way to Key West in a single trip. Everything that could go wrong on that trip went wrong. The car broke down like three times. Uh, I think two or three of us got sick. Uh, we couldn't find a hotel when the car broke down and it was like 105 degrees outside. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Uh, went, went wrong. The, the trip, it wasn't supposed to go like that. That's not how I had it in mind. That's not how I envisioned it, but that was the reality. That is what happened. And the same is true in the home sometimes. Sometimes our families aren't what they need to be. Uh, my husband doesn't lead like he should. He doesn't provide spiritually to our home and lead our home in a good spiritual direction, as is God's intention. Uh, we may say uh, that my, my wife doesn't support me and respect me like she should. My, my kids just won't listen to me. Sometimes things break. Things don't always go according to plan. Sometimes we fail to live up to God's glorious design, the design that we've been talking about in this series. And, and realistically, I mean, uh, in, in all honesty, not one of us uh, perfectly models uh, the principles that we've been talking about in this series. Men, women, children, uh, not one of us has this uh, I can complete ideal family that is completely perfect in every way. All of us have struggles. All of us have weaknesses. And, and, and I want to ask, why is this? Why does the home uh, not go according to plan uh, the vast majority of the time? I mean, if, if we truly believe that God is a good God that has our best interest at heart and he's created this design for men, women, and children that works best and produces joy, produces our greatest sat satisfaction, then why in the world don't we embrace it? Why in the world don't we make that a part of our lives? And that's because we're broken people who've been influenced tremendously by the power of sin. Sin has been unleashed in this world and is extremely, extremely powerful. And all of us have been influenced by it in one way or another. And it has affected our homes, not just a few, but all of them. But the truth is that we are broken people. And, and if you are in Jesus Christ, uh, this is true. We are a broken people who have been redeemed. We are being saved. We are being sanctified. We are being renewed into the image of Jesus Christ. And that includes our homes as well. 
So, here's the question that I want to explore briefly with you this morning concerning the home, and that's this. What does God say to us in our brokenness? What does God say to us in our brokenness? When the home doesn't live up to God's plans and expectations and we fail to embrace these, uh, these, these roles, what is God's message to us in those times? Uh, maybe an, another question, how do we embrace these roles when the strings of our hearts are pulling us in, 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 in another direction? Uh, how, how do we model these roles of, of sacrifice, of respect, of obedience, uh, when we are influenced by sin, when our homes are broken and torn apart uh, because of that. Uh, How how do we allow our homes to be vessels of God's mighty glory uh, when we ourselves didn't grow up in a strong home and maybe carry baggage uh, and trauma from our own childhood? What does God say to us in our brokenness concerning the home. Now, for the rest of our time uh, this morning, I want to look at uh, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, this, now, this passage, it's, it's not specifically about the home, uh, but I think the principles that we see within the passage are very applicable to the home and the family. So, we're going to be drinking from the Word of God today and looking at Isaiah 58. Just to give some background, remember that Isaiah, the prophet, he lived during the decline of Israel when, when, when this uh, massive threat of the, of the Assyrian Empire uh, loomed over uh, the nation and was a constant threat. If you do a study of uh, the ancient Assyrians, you'll see that they were one of the most brutal people, one of the most brutal nations uh, that, uh, that, that has ever been in existence. Uh, when they would take, uh, when they would capture nations and take them over and, and they would uh, often carry uh, the, the inhabitants into captivity. And the way that they would do that is that they would take fish hooks, hooks and attach them to the lip of one person and uh, the rear of another person and make this long chain of humans, leading them away into captivity. Very brutal, very brutal people. And that's not to mention the the methods of of torture um, that they exercised on those that they they conquered. So this this is the threat um, that's looming over the the, the nation here. Um, And Isaiah, he he preached the word of God uh, to this people that were defined as deaf and blind. Israel was deaf and blind. They didn't want to hear God's message. It says that in in chapter 6, verse 10. They they married themselves to false gods, to false idols, um, and gave themselves to idol worship and and rejected the one true God who gave them so many blessings time and time and time and time and time again, who showered them with his loyal love, with his grace, with his mercy, with his faithfulness, with his patience uh, over and over again. Uh, But idolatry, and this is what we're going to see within this text, idolatry wasn't the only sin that uh, Isaiah accused Israel of. In fact, one of the judgments that, uh, that, that Isaiah pronounces against Israel was that they adorned themselves with this kind of religious piety uh, on, on, the out, on, on the outside to make themselves look really good in the eyes of everybody around them, to make them look really righteous. But at the same time, they completely neglected the needs of the vulnerable, the needs of the weak in society, and they turned a blind eye to justice and fairness. Now, as we look at the theology of the Bible all the way from the beginning uh, to the end. When, when God created the world, we see that all creatures, both big and small, uh, were, were taken care of and had what they needed, uh, both strong and weak. And the pattern was that the strong would, uh, uh, would, would tend to the needs of, 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 of the weak and take care of those that were vulnerable. But a result of the fall, what happened in Genesis chapter 3, one of the subversions of God's design was that the powerful and the strong would now exploit the weak and vulnerable and use them as a means to an end. Exploit them and use them 
for gain. And Israel here, a, a nation that, you remember, Israel is supposed to be a, a kingdom of priests. They're supposed to be a light to the world so that all nations look around them and say, that's what God is like. The, because I see him through those people. That, that's what Israel was supposed to embrace. Uh, but rather, they embraced this same kind of fallen mentality where the strong thrived at the expense of the weak. And Isaiah condemns them very harshly for doing so. So, in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 12, that's where, what we're going to be looking at, it, it's an indictment against Israel. But... At the same time, it's a promise of hope and restoration and healing. That's a recurring theme throughout the prophets. You see judgment, yes, but you also see promises of blessing, of hope, of restoration when the faithful remnant submit to God in the present. And what we learn in this passage is that it teaches us that God, He's in the business of healing broken things. He's in the business of restoration and rebuilding if we walk by faith in Him in the present. Now let's look at the text together. Let's look at verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 58. Let's read verse 1 through 2. Let's just go through this text together. Cry aloud, God says to Isaiah. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. So in uh, the first two verses here, we see that God commands Isaiah to cry aloud, uh, to prophesy against the nation of Israel because their outward shows and signs of, of religious piety, their fasting specifically within this text, is nothing but a farce. They're, they're this nation that, that pretends to seek after God. They're this nation that pretends to have this outward form of, of, of righteousness before God and draw near to God. But the inside of their heart tell a completely different story. And notice what Isaiah says in verse 3. Why have we fasted and you see it not, Israel says to God. Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure, and you oppress all your workers. Israel here, they, they, they question God's rejection of their outward piety, of, of their fasting. And, and, they, and they say, look, God, we're doing everything right. We're doing everything that you told us to do. Why don't you accept us? And God says, behold... You think you're doing everything right, but you're turning a blind eye to the needs of the weak, to the cause of the poor. You're oppressing all those who work for you, and you think that I'm going to accept your outward form of religious piety? Look in verse 4. Behold, you fast, God says, only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? So we see here Israel's outward signs of religious piety mean absolutely nothing in the sight of God because they're doing so with the, this, this fallen mentality that began in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. A, a fallen mentality that has plagued the world since the very beginning. The strong live at the expense of the weak. And that's the way Israel modeled themselves. The prophet Hosea in verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 6, and Hosea says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. All of God's commands are important. Every single thing that God directs us to do has its purpose and has its place. But when we keep the codes 
and follow the commands and submit to the rules without a spirit of steadfast love toward my neighbor, following the rules mean nothing. And that's Israel's condemnation here. But next, within our passage in Isaiah 58, next God tells us the kind of heart that he is seeking and, and a kind of heart that is a reflection of his own. Look with me in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, from your own family members? Uh, that's what that means. So God says, this is, you know, this is what I desire from you. This is what I really want. This is the fast that I choose to free those who have not been treated fairly, who have not been treated justly, to be fair with your workers, to bring food to those who are hungry, to shelter the poor, to clothe the naked, and to take care of your mom and your dad and your family members when they get old and they can't take care of themselves. God says, that's the fast that I'm looking for. Actions that treat the weak and the vulnerable with dignity, with compassion, and with steadfast love. Now notice in verse 8, 8 through 10, then, then, if you do this, if, then, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. Notice here the, the, uh, the if-then logic uh, that's, that's being presented. If you do this, then this will occur. If Israel counts others, uh, even those that are undesirable within society, even those that are, that are difficult to take care of and to reach out to, if Israel counts others as more significant than themselves, then God will hear and call out, here I am. If you do this, then God is near. He's not far away from you. If you do these things, I'm not very far away. Verse 11 and 12, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations you shall be called the repairer of the breach of the broken the restorer of streets to dwell in. You see here, God is in the business of taking broken things and rebuilding them into something amazing. He's an expert at taking old, dry, dusty, black, sin-filled hearts and making them like new. He takes broken people who are poor in spirit, who recognize their depravity and sin and submit to him in faith and makes them into something incredible. That's the business that our God is in. And he even takes homes, even ones that are broken, and gives them hope and comfort and healing as they walk in him in the present. 
Now, back to our question, as you see on the screen. What does God say to us in our brokenness? When our homes break and are not what they need to be, what are some things that we can learn from this passage? Number one, I believe, God's grace is reaching out to us even when we've messed things up. And we will mess things up. One of God's primary attributes that we see echoed all throughout the Bible is patience. His slowness to anger that's repeated over and over and over and over again throughout the Bible. Proverbs 14, 29 says, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. A patient person is a person who displays wisdom. It's a mark of true greatness, as this passage says. Patience describes God perfectly. That's why patience describes God perfectly. In Psalm 145, 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Just think about our passage that we read this morning in Isaiah chapter 58. The whole passage is highlighting God's gracious and patient nature. His judgment and His grace. Israel, they, Israel deserved to be destroyed a long time ago. <laughs> they deserved to be wiped off the face of the earth because of their evil and sin and iniquity. But God is patient with them time and time again, and gives them a promise of blessing immediately after turning their ways, turning from their ways and seeking Him and seeking His face. And God responds the same to us when we've messed things up in the home. Maybe a dad today and, and wondering, am, am, I, am I doing this right? Am I doing everything the way that I need to be doing it? It's a question that I've asked myself multiple times. You might be a, a mom thinking, you know, I just feel so inadequate. I feel like no matter how hard I try or what I do, it's, it's just never enough. And many women have felt that way before. But the fact is that no home, no home is perfect. No home and perfectly embodies this vision that we've been talking about the past several weeks. Uh, we're, we're going to, at times, mess up the design and not lead and provide and submit and nurture like we should. But to keep moving forward, we've got to realize that His grace is continuously leading me and guiding me in the present, even if I fail. Even when, when I live in repentance to Him and acknowledge His ways as greater than my own. And that leads us to our next point. God's blessing is at our fingertips when we live in a state of continual repentance. Repentance is not just a one-time event. It's not a one-and-done thing. It's a lifestyle. Repentance is a lifestyle. And that's certainly true in the home. We, we experience God's blessing. Uh, like Isaiah says, we will be like a well-watered garden. I love to go out and look at my garden after a rain and see how, uh, he has, see how much everything is flourishing, how much everything has grown. We will be like, a, like an ever-flowing spring of life experiencing God's blessing when we live in continual repentance and look to Him as, uh, in, in His ways as superior continually and constant getting, constantly getting back to the pattern, even though we veered from it. Another thing as we wrap up uh, this morning, healing begins when we desire what God desires. Healing begins when we desire what God desires desires. God's telling Israel here that true spirituality and religious piety, it begins when they embrace his vision of those that are weak, of those that are, of those that are vulnerable, when, when, when they truly desire what he desires, uh, to, to, to have those that are hungry fed, to have those that are poor uh, to have shelter, to have those that are naked to be clothed. When we desire what God desires and seek that out, that is the beginning point 
of healing, a vision that looks to the needs of others more than itself, even when, even when people aren't very desirable. And that's true in the home. Another point that we see from this passage uh, is that God works through us. God works through us, even in our brokenness. God, you know, He's He's work, He's constantly working. Like the whole the whole Old Testament is the work of God to um, to bring about the, the the grand sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what the whole everything is leading up to uh, in the Old Testament um, that 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 we see. God works. He's working through the nation of Israel, even when they were a group of messed up people. Uh, you know, you, you read in the Bible, you look at all the different families uh, that we see uh, within uh, Scripture, specifically the Old Testament, uh, and it's very, um, it's very difficult to find a family uh, that is completely functional, <laughs> if not possible. Uh, what you see is over and over again very dysfunctional families, but what do you see? You see God working through those families to accomplish something great. And what does that tell us? It tells us that God works even when we are broken. I want to make this point. Uh, we're going to have to close here in a minute, but uh, many, many people see themselves, um, just in my experience and the people that I've, I've talked to before, many people see themselves as, as damaged um, because of maybe their past home life, a home that they grew up in. Uh, min many who uh, grew up in a family that had serious problems uh, think that they're almost incapable of functioning normally in the, in the present and, and modeling these kinds of healthy spiritual roles that we've been talking about. I want to read Psalm 2710 that dispels that myth. For my father and my mother have forsaken me but the Lord will take me in. Even if my mother and father leave me out in the cold, don't take care of me, don't model this kind of biblical vision, and I seek the Lord, the Lord will take me in. Even if our home wasn't what God designed it to be in the past, even if we grew up in a home uh, that didn't reflect these roles, we have a God who takes us in in the present and calls us his own and gives us a hope and gives us an identity. You're not damaged goods in your brokenness. Um, if, if, you did, if you didn't have a good home life, a good home background, God works through your brokenness to accomplish something amazing. And as we close this morning, God uses broken homes as vessels of his glory when they submit to him in the present. Uh, this morning, if you, anyone has a need uh, that they would like to make known uh, to us, if anyone has anything that they would, uh, on their mind, on their heart, anything that they're struggling with, the elders have set aside this time uh, for you to come forward now and for us to embrace you and pray with you. Uh, also, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus today, you know, this isn't just a gimmick that we do at the end of every sermon. This is the Lord's invitation that he's saying to you right now. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't have a relationship with him, don't wait. Don't put it off. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may, in fact, be too late. Repent of your sins. Believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Confess your faith in him. You can come forward and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and begin a relationship this morning with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you have any need, why don't you come as we stand and as we sing.